there's a lot of bro areas of data science. I think there are certain subreddits you can go to where they very much have this like macho, the bigger the data, the better. How many layers does your neural network have? You only went to a boot camp. That's not a real data scientist. Like there's a lot of that energy out there, but that is not the entire field. And don't let those areas intimidate you or make you think that you are less of a data scientist because you don't engage in those games. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Artists of Data Science podcast, the only self-development podcast for data scientists. You're going to learn from and be inspired by the people, ideas, and conversations that will encourage creativity and innovation in yourself so that you can do the same for others. I also host Open Office Hours. You can register to attend by going to bitly.com forward slash a D S O H. I look forward to seeing you all there. Let's ride this beat out into another awesome episode. And don't forget to subscribe to the show and leave a five star review. Our guests today are both data scientists who have collaborated on an amazing book on how to build a career in data science. One of them has earned a PhD in industrial engineering and has over a decade of experience helping companies like DSW and Airbnb use data. She's currently a principal data scientist at Brightly, where she creates models to help restaurants and retailers improve their customer experience. In her spare time, she likes to use data for humor like using deep learning to generate offensive license plates. One of them has earned a master's in management with a specialization in organizational behavior and has worked at companies such as DataCap, where she built and ran their experimentation analytics system, and at Etsy, where she's worked with the research team. She's currently a senior data scientist at Warby Parker, where she works on centralized team tackling some of the company's biggest projects. In her spare time, she's either kidnapping her parents' dogs or regularly giving talks on A-B testing, programming in R, and sharing data science career advice at conferences and meetups. So please help me in welcoming our guests today, the authors of Build Your Career in Data Science, Dr. Jacqueline Nolis and Emily Robinson. Thank you guys so much for being on the show. It's the first time I've done interview with two guests. So this is really exciting. I appreciate you guys taking time out of your schedule to be here. Thank you for having us. We're both excited. So talk to us about how you guys first heard of data science. How'd you get involved with data science? You know, kind of what drew you to the field? Uh, we can start with Jacqueline and then go on to Emily. Yeah, actually, I got my undergrad and master's in math and when I graduated, I really wanted a job using mathematics to help companies. And this is before data science was even a term. So it was like called analytics when I started, but I really just had this idea of, I really liked what I learned with a math degree and I wanted to use it to help companies. And I had this idea that there's someone who in a boardroom gets to be the person who says, oh, you want to do that idea, but I will use math to prove what the good idea is. I just had this desire to be that sort of a person, which now we call a data scientist. Yeah. And for me, as you mentioned, I have a master's degree in organizational behavior, and that was part of a PhD program I was doing. But after the two years, when I earned my master's, I decided academia wasn't quite for me. And data science actually was a pretty natural next step coming from the social sciences, which just surprised some people. But the quantitative social sciences are quite similar. You're thinking of a question that you want to investigate. You're gathering data to answer that, whether by running an experiment or using like archival data, data that already exists analyzing it and then you're presenting it to you know make a case for what you find and you know what should be done but that being said what drew me to industry was that those types of problems one are in academia it can sometimes be a bit artificial versus an industry like you're working very applied often with teams directly who are facing these issues and the life cycle of a data science project is usually more like a couple months like maybe a year versus in academia you might be working on the same paper for seven years so that's what drew me into data science and yeah it's been a good now about four years that i've been in the field 
So how did you two meet? So we met because we both were speakers at a conference together. Day to day, Texas, 2018, I think something. Emily, I saw when I was giving my talk first, I saw Emily in the audience and she asked a really good question at the end. And I'm like, oh, that's a smart cookie. And then later I sat down to hear a talk and it turns out it was by the same person as in the audience. And so we talked a little bit after and that's, did I miss anything, Emily? Does that? No, no that's the right thing. And then Manning had reached out to Jacqueline about the book. And so even though we'd only met this once at a conference, I think we did talk a little bit, but not like, you know, a long time. But, you know, Jacqueline reached out to me and asked if I'd be interested in uh, co-authoring a book. And that's how we got started. So you guys live across the country, right? So what's it like collaborating on a book together across space and time? What were some of the ups and downs that you guys had? I think actually it wasn't, it wasn't so bad. So as you mentioned, normally I'm in New York City, Jacqueline's in Seattle, and we did all our collaboration on the book with GitHub. That's how we wrote it. So we were writing in Word documents, but we were saving to GitHub just to make sure we always stayed in sync and to see the changes. And the other thing I think that really kept us on track was having a weekly call because it was really good for, you know, just figuring out, okay, where's the other person at? How's it progressing? I think we actually stuck pretty well to the schedule that we had. It was like a month and a half per chapter. So we, we split up the book into, we each did half the chapters and then we were done with the first draft. We sent it to the other person um, and they came back usually with a lot of edits, which we then incorporated. Well, and it was nice because it wasn't like, I was kind of expecting before starting the book that Emily would say something and I'd disagree. I'm like, oh no, the opposite of that is what the advice (laughs) I would give in a book like this. But like, I think that's largely not true. Generally, we would add to what each other said. Like, oh, you said idea A, but like, here, what if you add this part to it too? But it was never like, no, actually, I like strongly disagree with the way you put it. (laughs) Also, I think it's funny because the the times it's really worked out because Emily was on the East Coast, but she tends to stay up later than me. So I think like we kind of like the time zones worked in our favor. And also in the morning, I would wake up super early because I had a toddler or an infant when I was working on the book. The the kid became a toddler, (laughs) one child. And so I would always wake up super early because having a kid. And so, yeah, like it just, we were on the other coast. It would have been twice as hard. Yeah, I do think that worked out well. And I think actually, Jack and I have talked before, it, we could have, you know, we took on this project having never worked together and having met like in person once and it could have gone, you know, really not that well. But I think actually both of us were responsible, but also flexible, you know, like I took my honeymoon while we were finishing up the book, you know, or, you know, someone or Jacqueline would like took a vacation or had a especially busy week at work. It wasn't like, ah, oh, now you, you know, you go into the shame corner because you didn't finish exactly on time when you said you would. Yeah, so there's some uh, lesson here about finding someone to work with who you click with. And us just happen to get really lucky because we didn't do the vetting first. We just tried <laughs> it and So was there at all any particularly frustrating moment that you look back at it now and it just makes you laugh? Ooh, frustrating moments. I think there's like, people say writing a book is a lot of work. And I think this is true. It is a lot of work. But I don't think I really understood. I thought it was a lot of work in like, Like running a sprint is like a lot of work and it's real hard. No, it's like running a marathon is really hard, right? Like every week you have to write more for a year. And when you're like 60% of the way through, so you're a little bit more than half, you still have a lot left. You're just like, oh my God, this is so much. And I think there's like, not like one like funny story of aha, and then that was the most frustrating. It's really just the like morose 60 to 70% but milestones where you're just like, oh my God, will this be over yet? But I mean, I like the book. I like how it came out. But like that, I think was the hard part. Yeah. I also, I think one of the benefits of co-writing the book was so Manning, what they do is they send your book out for like an informal review, like after you finish each third. And we had like, in general, our reviews pretty positive And like, there were some, you know, obviously some comments of improvement. I remember one, I think this was on the final manuscript that was just really negative. And they actually recommended this book that got, that I'd never heard of that got terrible reviews on Amazon. And I think it would have been easy for me as a solo author to really personalize that and find it really frustrating. But I think actually with Jacqueline both being, I think a more, I don't know if optimistic is quite the right word, but like, <laughs> you're like, what is this jerk knows what he's talking, or just more confident in the work and being like, okay, every bit of, crit- we should hear the criticism, but that doesn't, just because someone wrote it doesn't mean it's valid. Which is, I think, a good lesson I would put as advice in our data science book that we already wrote. But like, I think this idea of, right, like a lot of people, they have imposter syndrome, this idea that like, oh, I'm not a real data scientist. Everyone's going to figure this out. And it's like, no, it's very much just a moment of like, hey, I know who I am. I believe in it. And if someone has some advice for me on how to change it, I will listen to that advice. And if someone just tears me apart, I'm going to be like, well, there's something going on with that person that maybe isn't related to me. And I'm going to accept that that's who they are. And I'm not going to let that change how I think of myself. And I think you kind of have to grow that. I don't think that comes very naturally to most people, including me. 
So how did you guys divvy up the chapters when it came time to figure out who works on what part? Was it kind of just what you guys felt most passionate about or was there drawing straws type of thing? Yeah. So I think some of them, you know, were kind of really clear. So like our last chapter is moving up the ladder and includes like, you know, being a manager and Jacqueline's been a manager and I haven't, but how we did it, which I thought worked well is we each. So once we came up with the outline of the chapters, we each put a rating on each chapter of like, you know, one being, we really don't want to write this chapter and five being we did. We did that without knowing the other persons and we compared and most chapters fell that like one of us had a preference. And then in terms of the ones that did it, I think Jacqueline had just ended up with more chapters being tilted in her favor for writing. So the ties went to me. Yeah. So it's fun because we used some sort of data analysis and an (laughs) algorithm to decide who wrote what, which is great. Thanks, guys. So let's get into your book. There's a few chapters in particular that I think the audience would really like to hear about. Well, there's the making an effective analysis, deploying a model into production, and working with stakeholders. But before we get started, it seems like you kind of talk about three different types of data scientists, kind of like protagonists in your book. Can you briefly describe these archetypes for us? Yeah. So the three types are sort of mapped somewhat to the three areas of data science are an analyst, so some focusing on analytics, decision scientist, so really focusing on statistics and inference, and a machine learning engineer focusing on machine learning. And why we divided this up is because data science is a really broad field and it's helpful often to delineate between the different types of roles. And some companies do this formally. So Airbnb, for example, has after all of their like data scientist title, it'll be like data scientist, comma, analytics, data scientist, comma, machine learning. Because often what they're looking for are people with very different backgrounds. So machine learning engineer may have a computer science education, may have been like sort of a quote unquote regular software engineer for a while versus a decision scientist could be someone with a strong background in statistics who would never want to work like engineering a a big thing that's going to go into production. The first to the final one, the analytics is someone who can really, you know, might do everything from making a dashboard to, you know, making reports for the executive team, often like finding what value can we get out of the data that we already have or like collect new data, because I think people can underestimate this, but especially early on for a company that's getting into data science, this is often the most valuable work. And there's a lot of low hanging fruit in the analytics space. And I would just say we included these three definitions intentionally all under the umbrella of data science. But I think there are a lot of people in the world who are weirdly gatekeepy about them, right? Like you're an analyst, you're not a data scientist. Analytics isn't data science. What you're doing is just analysis. And I mean, we really feel that if you're creating dashboards report, thinking about what visualizations to show executives, that's very much the same style of work as data scientists. And like it all kind of applies to the same thing. Similarly, the idea that like machine learning engineer is so different and somehow sometimes people think it's superior and more important and complicated than decision science. We don't think that's really true either. It's a lot of the same ideas of decision science. You just take a little bit more of a software engineering approach to them. So for us, we really intentionally, we brought down those gates. We really think that they're all kind of in one bucket, just different flavors of that kind of idea. I absolutely love that you guys have that philosophy, have that point of view, because I think it's really important, especially, you know, for people trying to break into the field, having that gatekeeper kind of mentality there, you know, oh, I'm just a data analyst. Well, nah, man, you play an important role in the process as well. And I really like how in your book, after every chapter, after every section, you kind of break down how this particular thing applies to these particular roles. I thought that was really cool how you did that. But yeah, let's go ahead and let's jump into making an effective analysis, starting with a real seemingly easy question. What is an analysis really? What is an analysis? So we kind of talk about this in the book. People are, in general, an analysis is like a thing that answers on a question, right? So if a business stakeholder is like, We want to know why this product is doing poorly or why these customers are leaving. An analysis is like a file, like a PowerPoint or an HTML file or whatever, Jupyter Notebook, like something that gives the answer, methodologically walks through and gives an answer. Or you say reporting, slightly different, but very similar. And reporting is the idea. It's like automated way. So if you have a R or Python script that each week calculates the average number of customers and what percent of customers have left and like automatically puts that into an Excel file, that like weekly thing is a report. An analysis is more for answering questions. A report is more for getting data to people on a repeatable basis. So what are the traits that separate good analyses from bad analyses? Oh, there are so many. And Emily, I'm going to name a few. And Emily, I'm sure you're going to be like, oh, Jacqueline, you forgot the one that bothers me the most. I think for me, one um, trait that really bothers me about a bad report, like a bad report is not repeatable, right? If I 
do an analysis on my computer one time, I make a PowerPoint of it, and then I delete the analysis so you can never see the calculations and results and try and repeat it, that I would consider a bad report because we haven't like kept the evidence on how it works. I guess I would say another sign, a good analysis, the difference between good and bad is how much can the business stakeholder understand it, right? Are you using easy to understand language? Are you making a clear, like, oh, here's the clear result you should derive from this. Here's how you get that. Like, is that how clear it is, is the distinction between good and bad? Like, can, can other people besides a data scientist understand it? That's another one I would say. Jacqueline, how are the types of analyses different for the different types of data scientists? So I would say a decision scientist's whole job is to make analyses, right? Like a decision scientist is using data to answer questions. So it's very natural that what they do is create analyses for each question they have to answer. But a machine learning engineer, for instance, makes analysis too. They may use analyses to make some documentation on why is the model working poorly in these situations? Or how is my training accuracy improving over time? And why should I choose model A over model B? These sorts of things also fall into the form of, hey, some document that I share with non-data scientists improve results. And I mean, that's true for analysts as well. They also still have to be doing, making one-off analyses that kind of just show why things are happening for them. So I'd like to get into asking questions and how to translate requests from the language of a business question to a data science question. Emily, do you think you can share some insight on how we could do that? How can you take what the business stakeholder tells us and then convert that into like a data science problem? Absolutely. So we adapted this framework from Renee Teet, which is exactly as you said. So junior data scientists, they probably would realize it if they thought about it, but Unlike a Kaggle competition that's like, well, here's all the data that you need, and here is the exact question, like predict this outcome, business, the questions you'll face in industry are going to be a lot more vague. So an example we give in the book is, for example, how can we split our customers into different groups to market to? And so you translate that to the data science question of how can we run a clustering algorithm to segment the customer data? And then you get the data science answer from that. So for example, oh, it means clustering, you know, I found three distinct groups, but that's not very useful to the business uh, because in the example of clustering, you know, those groups don't come with handy labels. So instead what you want to give the business is saying like, here are three types of customers, new, high spending, and commercial. The type of skill that you need for that is definitely need some communication skills throughout this and also business domain knowledge. And domain knowledge is something that is it can be hard to get before starting your data science job, or even if you've worked in data science before, if you transition to a different industry, you may have to learn new things. But it's really important to work to understand your data because that can help you in the process of figuring out, okay, what problem are they actually trying to solve by asking this question? Because sometimes they will do the translation for you and they will, you know, sort of say, oh, can you pull these numbers on this? But if you dig into it, it turns out those numbers are actually not going to be helpful for solving the problem that they're having. So occasionally you need to actually bring the data science question that they ask you. You need to work it back to the underlying business question and potentially retranslate it. And sometimes when I get a data set, I'm kind of guilty of just cracking my knuckles and wanting to start, you know, typing away at the keyboard and getting down and dirty with it. So what are some foundational questions that we can answer for ourselves Emily, before we start just getting down and dirty and writing code? Yes. So definitely, as I mentioned, like, okay, what's the problem that we're actually trying to solve here? And the importance of writing analysis plan uh, is, you know, one, it can give you some direction, but it can also keep the analysis from going on for too long because that's another component of a good analysis is it can be done quickly. You know, there are some data science jobs that are very research heavy and it, it may be totally fine to go into a cave and, you know, work for a year on one problem, reading a bunch of academic papers, but most jobs are not like that. So an analysis plan means that you're limiting your scope and you come to an agreement with stakeholders on how you're going to be tackling the problem and get that sign off from them. And because that makes it easier when you've reached sort of the end of it. Maybe that you come back and you're like, you know, I looked at these things and it doesn't seem like there's, you know, unfortunately, there's not really the data to answer this question or I've eliminated these possible things. Uh, having signed off on that analysis plan can help prevent the situation where the business stakeholders are just like, we'll just keep working on it, you know, keep looking at new things because at some point it's not worthwhile to just keep digging in. I really appreciated that part of the book. And I like how you guys had a sample analysis plan that kind of outlined 
what we should kind of structure our analysis plan and what it should look like. But that's very cool to see that they look like my analysis plan. So there's a bit of validation there from some actual data scientists. That's pretty cool to see. But I want to jump into now, like talking about deploying models into production. And this is something that doesn't get a lot of coverage in many books, really. I think a lot of books will just present algorithms and code, but you never really get the other side dealing with deploying models into production. So Jacqueline, what the heck is deploying a model into production mean anyways? So this is actually a great segue into just kind of how my career played out. So as I said, my undergrad and master's were in math, and I went and I worked as a data scientist, basically doing all sorts of analyses, making reports and analyses and sharing them with the executives and things like that. Then I went and got a PhD and I moved into consulting, but still my job at the end of the day, every job and consulting engagement I had was more or less some form of take data, do some modeling on it, put it into a PowerPoint or HTML file, share that with executives. Up until about two years ago, no, maybe a little more than that, but some number of years ago where my career started shifting into, hey, instead of writing code to make up some results you put into a PowerPoint, let's actually write code that then has to run continuously in a way that like customers will actually hit it. So going from writing code that runs once to make some charts you put into a PowerPoint to code that may have to run multiple times a second in systems that if the systems go down, customers are actually harmed. It's a very different experience. And I was really scared of this kind of work for a long time. And this is much more the work of what you'd call a machine learning engineer of like actually taking models and putting them into systems that are continuously run. I was very scared of this kind of work for a long time because it just seemed like so different from the decision science kind of work I was doing of analyses to show executives. But after getting into it, I realized that most of the principles were the exact same. It's still very much about doing good modeling, getting good results. The only difference is, are you going to make a PowerPoint file or are you going to make code that turns into an API, which is basically like a fancy website where every time you go to that website, that hits your code, which causes your code to run, and then you return a result that way. So like the wrapper is a little different, but the basic work is largely the same. And so that ended up spawning a whole chapter of this book. And can you provide us an illustrative example of putting a model into production? What does that look like? You know, let's say we're at a company and we have a, a churn model, right? So I make a model that takes a set of customers and predicts if they'll churn or not. So as a decision scientist, I may do an analysis that predicts the churn of all the customers and then may make a report that says, we expect that half our customers are going to churn in the next year. But so that's the kind of decision science side. To put it in production would be like, okay, I want to actually take this code and make it so that any time a software engineer can do something that will predict the churn of a customer. And the way I'll do that is I'll make something, you know, it's called a REST API, which is I'll make some code that when you run the code, it just hosts as like basically like a fancy website. When a software engineer goes to the URL, like www.churnmodel.com slash customer has been with us for five years. And I put the information about customer in the URL. When I go to that website, my code will then run and then it will return the prediction of the probability of their churning. So that's the basic idea. And so the work behind that is I have to take the code that I've written in Python or R or whatever language, you know, presumably Python or R, and I need to make it into running on some like server in the cloud as opposed to just running on my laptop. And the actual steps to having your code run on the cloud, like you could literally just go to Amazon or Google Cloud, pay for a virtual machine and then install R or Python, start your Flask or Plumber service and like actually have your code run that way. There are very straightforward ways to do this, but for like enterprise companies and production systems that are large and integrated, they have more elegant ways that can, much more manageable. But the point is, it's basically like you're setting up computers somewhere in the world that are going to be running this code for you continuously. And now that we've got the thing in production, Jacqueline, right, we've got the model, it's in production. How do we keep the thing running? Okay, so that's great. Great question. So ideally, if you have it running on a server in you know, AWS on the Amazon cloud, if you just have it running on a server, hopefully it should continuously always be running, right? If you hit start on your run web service, and so in R it's called Plumber's a service that does it. In Python, you use Flask or there are other ones too. But you hit start on the Python or R script and they'll start hosting this website. And so your system should just always be running. So long as that server's on, that system should always be running. And anytime you hit it, you know, you go to that URL and you pass it the parameters, you will get your prediction back for the customer's probability of churning. That said, you know, you want to do things like, well, if we get a lot of traffic, we want to scale that out. We want it so that, you know, software engineers, you know, people who are not data scientists should be controlling that server. This is a whole type of job called 
DevOps to make sure these things are managed. And the modern ways of doing this are using things called Docker containers and Kubernetes, if you heard a lot, or like systems to help do this. And so like there's a whole universe of people who have thought very deeply, very deeply about how to have this stuff continually run. And the software engineering world has done this for a very long time. And so as a data scientist, you really just get to piggyback off that and just set your code up to work in the ways that whatever company you're working with, DevOps teams or IT teams have already set up for all the other code that they are continuously running. And this next question, I'll turn it over to Emily here. So we've done all the math, all the statistics and whatnot to build our action model, right? Now that this thing has been released out into the wild, it's doing its thing. What are some things that we need to monitor? And maybe from a statistics and from a business standpoint, when that thing's in production? And at what point do we retrain this model? Yeah. So the first thing you want to monitor is like, is it even working at all, not as in as like, is it even accurate, but like, are there errors happening? Like, is it still serving recommendations or giving back a result? So you can use logging to record if there's any issues when errors happen and you can take, you can monitor that. And there's a lot of tools out there that can help with that, like Datadog that you mentioned, right? So even if it keeps working and it keeps returning results, it may be getting less accurate over time. And that's a pretty common thing um, often called model drift. And, you know, we'll just find that like, yes, this was the accuracy metrics when we put this into production. We're good enough that we want to do this, but they've gotten worse since then. So, you know, kind of the simplest way is you just basically run the training steps for the model again, but with new data. So with the last couple months of data, you may find that, you know, this actually is enough to solve the problem and you're giving it more examples, you're giving it more recent examples, maybe something's changed over time. But, you know, there may not be enough because also when do you do this? Do you just sort of keep an eye on it? Like do you build a dashboard to monitor it? And we think a better practice is to, you know, set a standard amount of times when you're going to retrain the model. So maybe this many months, and you can even automate that process. So if you have the script that loads the data, builds a model, you can actually put that on a schedule. So you don't have to spend time, you know, doing the work yourself. You can just have it run automatically and have it send an alert like, okay, what's the new accuracy metrics? How's the new model performing? And if it's not, if it doesn't improve anything or somehow it gets even worse and you manually take a look at it. But if that doesn't happen, you can just have it set on a schedule and be running fine. Um, I want to add two points to that. I think Emily's totally right. Just two points to that. One is having that model automatically retrain, as Emily said, it's, it's a common practice. It is a good idea. But what you're now doing is you now have two systems in production. You have the production model and then the production retrainer that automatically retrains. So that is twice as much upkeep of models, but that can generally be fine. You know, you might need two computers, two virtual cloud computers running or whatever, but that's fine. You have now two code bases to maintain. Point I would make though is that generally people tend to err on over retraining, like retraining too quickly and getting to the process of automatically retraining too early, right? People, like drift does happen, but I think people in general tend to overestimate how big of a problem drift is. And so a lot of the engineering work that people do around automatically retraining, like every day the model retrains, blah, blah, blah. a lot of that stuff I would say is premature optimization. Like you may be fine by hand retraining that once a year manually, like that might just be fine. And if that is fine, the process of creating an automatic retrainer that retrains once a day, Like that's a lot of work to build that system and maintain it when you could have just done it by hand once a year and like, ah, it's fine, who cares? Thank you so much for that. Yeah, this is a topic I feel like that does not get enough coverage in many books. So I appreciate you guys including it in your book. And I love the treatment that you guys gave it in your book as well. And just for the audience that's listening, when it comes to monitoring things like you mentioned, model drift, data drift, concept drift, things like that, do you want to shout out some metrics that we can track and maybe look up so that we're aware of these things when you know they get brought up in an interview setting? Okay, so I will sort of answer this, but more punt on it, which is like, yeah, you can monitor the root mean squared error of your model and the prob- you know, the percent of times your model gets the answer right and blah, blah, blah. There's like a lot of things you could measure. But I think the thing is here, there's really not like rights or wrong answer. It is so dependent on what your model is, right? Like the things you want to measure for drift in terms of an 
a natural language processing model are totally different than the things you might want for drift in like a churn model. And even if you are in the world of natural language processing models, it is so different what you might want to measure if you're measuring using NLP to predict which category a customer is in or to predict what response you should say to them. Like it is so context dependent that if an interviewer literally asks you the question, what metrics would you want to measure for an arbitrary system of checking drift? Like I would, I mean, and like I'm senior enough to do this. I would punt back of like, I don't actually think that's an appropriate interview question. You need much more context before you can make a statement like that. I find that with a lot of data science stuff, the answer typically starts with, well, it depends, right? So another thing that doesn't get covered in a lot of books is how to interact with and speak to non-data scientists. And you guys have an entire section dedicated to working with stakeholders. So Emily, who are the various types of stakeholders that we may encounter in our data science career and what do they care about? Yeah. So we talk about four different types of stakeholders. So the first is business stakeholders. So this is a little bit of a catch-all, but it's, you know, for example, people who work in the marketing department or sales or customer care. So kind of non-technical colleagues. Then there's the engineering side, which is maybe the most familiar for folks. There's the leadership, so executive leadership at a company. And finally, there's actually your manager who may be a data scientist, but often people don't necessarily know how to work effectively with their manager. And that can be like one of the most important relationships and really determine how your career is going to go. What's up, artists? I would love to hear from you. Feel free to send me an email to the artists of data science at gmail.com. Let me know what you love about the show. Let me know what you don't love about the show. And let me know what you would like to see in the future. I absolutely would love to hear from you. I've also got open office hours that I will be hosting, and you can register by going to bit.ly com forward slash a d s o h i look forward to hearing from you all and i look forward to seeing you in the office hours let's get back to the episode and can you share any tips for our listeners out there who might find themselves in a room full of executives and how they should tailor their communication when they're in front of that particular audience? Yeah. So the thing to know about leadership, right, is that they're very busy. This is the case, whether it's at a startup, just sort of usually where you're more likely if you're junior to be talking to an executive and to a huge company, right? They're, they're all executives have very busy, tight schedules. So this means that you should focus when you communicate on being brief, on getting to the point, and with that, you know, you can have, for example, an appendix. So some leaders do like to go more in depth. So maybe have that available. But, you know, you should have, like, if you're setting the report, have an executive summary at the top, which is a paragraph. That's a good practice in any case. If you're doing, you know, a PowerPoint presentation, just keep in mind that, you know, they're going to be really focused. They want to get to the point. They need to know what should they do with this data versus maybe the marketing department where you form, you know, a relationship where you have multiple meetings every week. And, you know, they want to really dive into the details. The executive is not going to be taking on the project themselves, uh, but they want to understand the implications of it and what needs to be done. And Jacqueline, what are some questions that we can ask ourselves when we're considering possible tasks to work on? Because sometimes people are just so excited to finally have a data scientist in the organization, finally have a data scientist to do some work, and we might get bombarded with a bunch of things to do. Yeah. And so I think this is an interesting question because it may not feel like you actually have that much control of what you work on as a data scientist, especially a more junior data scientist. You may feel like you are just given tasks and you have to do the task, but usually you actually you may not realize just how much control you have in terms of like, well, what's the order in which you're going to work on the tasks you have? And well, when you have a little time and you're not busy, like what are you going to kind of do on in that extra space? And so even if you don't directly get to say that the team's strategy is to focus on X, you maybe maybe don't have that level of control and you might if you're the only data scientist, but even if you don't, you may indirectly get to contribute to a lot of like kind of what exactly you're going to work on. And so there's really two axes we cover in the book. One axis is 
how impactful is this work going to be, right? Like, is this something that is going to help everyone like immediately in the future? How impactful? Is this going to really change everything? Or is it kind of like more of like a low stakes kind of interesting? And then the second is how innovative. Is it like really like new and exciting? Or is it kind of like mundane, just like we have to do the same task again and again? And if you kind of cut by those two axes, you kind of can like then get a quadrant system where you have a couple different quadrants. Like one quadrant that data scientists fall into a lot is this like ivory tower sort of quadrant. And this is the one that I feel very passionately about. And this is the area where the kind of work where data scientists, you know, they have this grand idea, right? Like, well, what if we made a model, right? Like what if, you know, for a car company, what if we made a model that designed the car itself? Right, like like this grandiose idea that no one's asking for, that you just kind of have a hunch that you feel like might be good and you spend years working on it. A lot of data scientists get stuck on this kind of ivory tower. I think this stuff's interesting. But that work, it's not really impactful. Like it's not providing value right away because it's so ivory tower. And like no one's, like it's super innovative, but so innovative that like you kind of get lost in the weeds. Whereas, you know, you can imagine there's work of like, hey, we have much more practical, like this model, we really, the business is asking for it and we can build it today. Like that's kind of the best kind of work. And even the mundane stuff of like, look, it's not interesting, it's not new, but like, hey, we have the standard reporting that just needs to get done. Let's just keep getting it done, maybe improve it a little. All of those sorts of work is like stuff you should think about and really just try and think about like, hey, am I avoiding these bad states like ivory towers where I'm doing work that's just fascinating intellectually, but maybe doesn't provide value to anyone. I found that decision matrix that you guys laid out in your book to be really cool. It reminded me of the Eisenhower decision matrix. So I really, really enjoyed that. Your book is chock full of amazing content and figures and illustrative examples that I encourage everyone to go out there and get their hands on it. So thank you for diving deep on your book. Shifting gears here a little bit, I want to talk about building data science teams from the ground up. Doing research on both of you guys seems like you both have some great experience when it comes to building teams. Emily, what do you think are some of the essentials to kind of lay the foundation on, on which the house of data can be built? So I think the first thing that any house of data needs is good data engineering. And so this can either come in the form of there already being a data engineering team or those being hired at the same time as the first data scientists, or it will be your job as the first data scientist to build that data engineering part. Because even, so why do you need data engineering? A couple reasons. So first is, well, you can't do much data science without any data. So for example, if you work for a company that is mostly a website, an online business, and they're not tracking, like they're certainly tracking things like conversions, right? They're tracking when people buy, but maybe they're not tracking page views. Maybe they're not tracking where people, how people land on their site. Maybe they don't have good tracking with their email. And in that case, any questions around that before you can answer them, you have to implement the ways to record that data. But even if that data does exist, it may not be in the format and the sort of stored in the right way for you to use it as a data scientist. So for example, I talked to someone who was one of the first data scientists at a company and the data was stored in tables, like for example, page views, but it took them six minutes to run a SQL query for this table that was only about a million rows, took six minutes to run just because the data wasn't optimized to be stored to be queried. It was optimized to be used maybe for the website. So I think that's really the first fundamental thing because also as you build a team, you either have to look for other people who have that skills or you have to be the one or working with the data engineering team to lay that foundation because a lot of data scientists don't necessarily have that background. And Emily, I'm somebody who's a first data scientist in an organization who's you know, supposed to build a practice from the ground up. What are some challenges that you foresee me facing? And can you share some encouragement, some words of advice to keep me going? <laughs> I feel like I actually should, I'm going to punt this question to Jacqueline because we actually have different. So I am someone who really never wants to be the first data scientist um, versus Jacqueline is like, I, you know, I love this and has been the first data scientist. So I'm going to let Jacqueline make that pitch. Yeah. I've been the first data scientist like three, four times, depending on how you count. Like, yeah. So I think, right, when you're a first data scientist, you're juggling a lot of things, right? Like one is you kind of, need to figure out what your job even is, right? Because if you're at a company that has no data science before, they don't necessarily know what you're supposed to be doing, right? Should you be making models? Should you be showing reports to people? Like what is exactly, like what, what is your, the goal of your job? Usually you have to kind of define that. So that's part thing one you have to do. Thing two, you actually have to do that job, right? You actually have to be making models and you actually have to be creating reports. 
You actually have to be doing the work. And then lastly, you are setting precedents with everything you do for future data scientists that will be hired. So if you use R, future data scientists will probably have to use R. If you use Python, they'll use Python. If you use Bo, Git, Git. So you have to be constantly thinking about, is this decision going to be good for everyone in the long term? And the job of the first data scientist is to balance those three things effectively. And so the pitfalls I would say to watch out for is just, you could easily get stuck on any one of those things, right? You could spend so much time trying to figure out what you should be doing that you don't actually do any work. You could spend so much time doing actual work that you don't figure out what the right precedents are. And when people join, they can't actually, like the team can't be built. They can't use your code. Like there's no precedent set there and things are difficult as you scale. And you can spend so much time trying to set the right precedents that you don't actually do work or no one in the business knows what you're doing and they never decide to hire a second scientist. So that continual balance is just enormously important to being the first data scientist. And really something I just like every hour you should be thinking about it, I would say, to really try and get this right. But Jacqueline, that sounds like so much work. Why would anyone ever want to do that? Oh, that's a great question. Why would anyone want to do it? I will tell you, as a person who likes doing this, one, it rules because you get to set the precedence. You like R, the team uses R. You like GitHub, the team uses GitHub. And this isn't quite true. As people join, they may want to change it. But being the person who gets to say the first thing is very different than the person who says the second thing. So like, that's enormously valuable to craft the actual decisions the way you like them. Second, it is enormously fun to figure out what your work should be, right? If you're the kind of person who likes solving problems, really like problems, then the puzzles of, hey, should we as a company even be thinking about churn right now? As we a company, should we be building a forecast model? Like, which of these are good places to put our effort? That is a fascinating problem to solve, just as much as should I use a random force or an XG boost? And if you like those kinds of puzzles, then being the first data scientist is really good. And lastly, it can accelerate your career very quickly. By being the first data scientist, you have to learn a lot of things, including how to manage stakeholders, how to manage other data scientists as they join. And so if you want to become like a director or things like that, having the experience of building a team from scratch, being the first person, like that is a great way to kind of get into that role. Thank you so much for that. I really appreciated that. So what do you look for then in data science candidates when you're trying to bring more people onto your team. Emily, do you have any tips on how someone can cultivate these qualities that you're looking for within themselves? I know definitely technical skills are a must, but apart from those, what are those skills or traits that you're looking for? Yeah. So as you mentioned, right, like technical skills are kind of the base level we talk about in the book. Like, for example, can you be a data scientist? and not do any programming. And our opinion is, well, one, we think there are reasons to do programming, but two, practically, no, most uh, data scientist positions now require you to program. So yeah, as you mentioned, that's a table stakes, but okay, what else do you need? And I think a big part that can be overlooked is almost all companies will have a behavioral interview as well as a technical interviews. So behavioral interviews are things like people asking like, what's a project you worked on and what did you learn from it? Or, you know, tell me about a time you disagreed with a coworker. And so the idea is they're looking to understand First, can you communicate because you have to communicate in that answer Two, you know, what experience do you have? So for example, with a disagree with a coworker, do you give an answer like, oh yeah, I've worked with a lot of really like stupid marketers and it was so annoying and they didn't get like this R thing and they disagreed on this, you know, and just sort of showing that you don't have empathy for the stakeholders that you worked with. You didn't try to see their side or you end the, the situation resolves and you were like, yeah, I got, them, I got them fired because they didn't know how to do this thing. So those are the types of things you can practice how to frame your answer and also practice and think before you go into interviews, like what are some situations, what are some projects that you worked on, difficult situations that you could use to answer multiple questions? Um, because that can really help you prepare to give a thoughtful and informed answer. And so the method that I like to use for answering these types of questions is called the STAR method. So it's the situation, task, action, and result. So basically you describe what was the situation that happened? What was the problem? What was your responsibility in that situation? What did you do? And then what was the outcome? What was the result of that? And that really can help you tell an effective story to the person who's asking the question. Thank you so much for that. Jacqueline, I'm wondering, how do you view data science? Is it an art or is it purely a hard science? So actually, I got to say, I really got a kick out of the name of this podcast because I am actually an amateur artist in my free time. And so truly, I am an artist of data science. 
Anyway, I think it is, it's like, I don't even think it's like, I don't know if I call it an art or a science. It's much more like, like a form of communication, like data science. It's like, oh yes, it's building models. And oh yes, it's being thoughtful and like how you design them and creativity and architecture. But it's very much of like, hey, you have a person here who disagrees with you. How do you convince them to agree with you using these numbers? I mean, that process of like, it's like convincing, negotiating, kind of like little bit of charisma in there, like that kind of using data as a way of changing someone's mind. To me, that's what the pure essence of data science is, is like getting people to change their mind with the numbers that exist in the world. I think of it very, very deeply as a human thing. When people hyper focus or hyper fixate on the exact algorithms and the exact accuracy and, you know, do I use root mean squared error, MAE? I mean, those stuff, that stuff matters, but it matters just as much of like, hey, do I actually show 10 graphs in this presentation or one really thoughtful graph that like proves the point better? Like that sort of stuff is so valuable. And to me, like that to me is data science. And Emily, how about you? How do you view data science? Is it an art or is it purely a hard science? It is definitely not purely a hard science. And I think that's also where you can get issues. So a big topic that's been coming up recently has been bias. And so biased algorithms, biased data, and the effects that has in the real world. And I think it's very dangerous when folks are like, oh, well, you know, like maybe the, so one, there are people, but usually outside the field who are like, it's an algorithm, it's scientific, it's objective. Like there's no such thing as a discriminatory algorithm. And I do think the field, like people working in the field have moved past that point and recognize, oh no, there are definitely algorithms that do discriminate. So whether that's, you know, certain, uh, Kathy O'Neill has a great book, Weapons of Math Destruction, that talks about the, effects of some algorithms that might be on something like teacher pay or promotions. But then there's other ones where like certain automatic tools don't work for people with darker skin. Or there was a recent one that came up with this facial. The idea was, okay, we could take a pixelated face and, you know, make, get back out what the face actually looks like. And someone put a pixelated face of Obama and it turned into a white guy. And there's a lot of theories why that is. And probably one of them is the training set probably did not have a you know, diverse set of faces to learn from. So I do think that we want to be careful when we of saying too much like, oh, this is objective, this is scientific, this is just the facts, like this is just the statistics, because you really need to think about all the possible ways that um, bias crept in because data is not the ground truth, data is not objective, and there's lots of issues lying there. So I think that is more, you can approach it in some ways scientifically, but there is some of an art of communicating with people, of understanding context. That's really important when you're working on projects that affect people's livelihood. And Jacqueline, how would you say the creative process manifests itself in data science? As a person who, like I said, does art in my free time, when I'm painting, you know, or I'm like doing an oil pastel of a landscape, there's a certain amount of like, okay, well, I'm going to split this painting into first the mountains and then the trees and the trees I can tell have two colors in them and blah, blah, blah. And so creative endeavors still have a certain amount of problem solving and like breaking things up into smaller ideas and executing those ideas. And I think that same sort of thinking happens when you're building like a, a machine learning model, right? The painting was to paint a picture of some mountains, but the machine learning model, I'm trying to make a model that predicts churn. And so I'm going to well, I need to break it up into creating the features and then the model choice. Okay, the model choice, I have to break that up into like, well, should I use hyperparameter tuning or not? And like, you know, just creating all these smaller problems out of the big ones. And I think to me, the creative process is very much how do you decide to take the big problem and to split it into little things? Like there's a lot of creativity, I think, in that. You know, I think you can just be very, you know, the difference between a model that technically produces an accurate result and a model that is really easy to maintain and really thoughtful in its decisions and not hyper complex. I think that to me is just, that's a lot of creativity there. So even if we don't think we're creative in our work, we actually are because it seems like there's a lot of choices, right? And I think it's the choice that makes it creative in a sense. I mean, if your job is every day to hit run on a linear regression, copy paste the results into a PowerPoint and then email that to someone, literally like that, like then you maybe you don't have as much creativity. But if you're designing something new, then I think there is inherent creativity in the work you are doing. I absolutely love that. Thank you so much for that. So the next, pretty much all the questions, let's go alphabetical order on this. We'll go Emily and Jacqueline for responses. I'm first wondering if you can speak to your experience being a woman in tech and if you have any advice or words of encouragement for the women in our audience who are breaking into or currently in tech. Sure. 
I think the two things that I would recommend is one, definitely find a community. Maybe you want a community of other women or non-binary people. So for example, I'm a big fan of Our Ladies, which is a global organization promoting the um, advancement and inclusion of gender minorities in R. So that's one, but you know, it doesn't have to necessarily be a group like that. It could just be your local meetup group or it could be folks you meet at a conference, but just having other people there um, I think especially other you know, women is really helpful both to have folks who are at the same level as you, to have people who are maybe coming up behind you to remind you like, oh yeah, I have grown and I've learned some stuff and I have things to give back and to see you know, women who have been very successful, which fortunately, especially in areas of data science that are more statistics oriented is quite common. And my second piece of advice is to find sponsorship. So mentorship is something most folks are very familiar with. You know, I, I want a mentor, like getting advice from people. But sponsorship is actually often much more powerful. And research has shown that women are over-mentored but under-sponsored. So sponsorship is when someone actually kind of gives you resources. So that could be financial scholarship for a conference. It could be bringing your name up in a meeting, recommending that you work on a project. It could be putting your name up for a promotion, recommending you speak at a conference. And so we talk about this a bit in the book. I also have a blog post on the topic, but I think it's worthwhile for folks to keep in mind and be on the lookout and thinking about, okay, how can I get you know, both the community, but also some folks who can help me advance in my career. So my advice for women and gender minorities in data science is a little biased because I have never been both a woman and a junior data scientist, which is usually when this advice is most helpful. So I've never been both those at the same time. But that said, the thing that I would say, in addition to Emily's good advice, is there's a lot of bro areas of data science. I think there are certain subreddits you can go to where they very much have this like macho, the bigger the data, the better. How many layers does your neural network have? You only went to a boot camp. That's not a real data scientist. Like there's a lot of that energy out there, but that is not the entire field. And don't let those areas intimidate you or make you think that you are less of a data scientist because you don't engage in those games. I mean, so much of the like big data needs better, blah, blah, blah. So much of that stuff exists out there. And like, man, I'm like a, I'm a principal data scientist. I've been in this field for many years. I've barely touched on most of those cutting edge technologies that people talk about in those spaces. And I've been very successful and just fine. And I've helped out many companies. And I'm no less of a data scientist because I don't use whatever tool they use. Like it's fine. So really, you know, by being in the spaces Emily suggested, by finding more Women, you will get other voices and don't just let that bro attitude define what the field is for you. Oh, I absolutely love that, Jacqueline. That was really good. So I think, Emily, to your point, there's a book that I really liked. I think it's by Sylvia Ann Hewlett. It was exactly that title, Forget a Mentor, Find a Sponsor. Definitely recommend that book for, for anyone out there listening. So what can the data community do then to foster diversity and inclusion in our space? Yeah, there's a lot of different things. I think one is the creation of meetup group of kind of these, you know, spaces where you can see yourself represented. So I mentioned our ladies, there's pie ladies, there's a new group data umbrella um, for kind of all underrepresented minorities in data science. So I think that's one. The second is, I think, to be very conscious of it. And also think, especially like maybe you're a white man listening to this podcast, how can you support people who are underrepresented? And think beyond necessarily just giving advice because sort of on the sponsorship mentorship uh, part, like people may think like, oh, I just, you know, people... I need to help folks, be, underrepresented folks become qualified. And actually a lot of them are already qualified and what they need are opportunities. So what they need is for you to recommend, say you're a, a regular conference speaker and you, you know, you see someone at a lightning talk, you know, maybe, you know, talk to them and say, hey, can I recommend you for this, you know, bigger conference or bring up their name in a meeting or refer them to a position. So, you know, I actually have uh, someone who tells me they keep a list of women, uh, great women speakers in the data science field because they're a prominent speaker and they're often asked for their recommendations. And I think that's one concrete way that you can help out people is to use whatever kind of privilege and opportunities you've had and pass that along to other people. And I want to double down on this because I think Emily is right. But like, let's say you're a white man and you're like, well, what can I do? 
And having formerly been a white man who was reasonably far in data science, you're going to find there will be a point or a day, there's going to be some moment where you want to help, but that help would be too much, right? Like you want to support, you want to support women and minorities, but in this situation to support them means we would have to turn down this client because let's say we have a, a client who's sexist. We can't, if we turn them down, then we would lose money. Like there's a material loss there. There are going to be these moments where you're going to have to put things on the line, put your career on the line, your business on the line, and take hits in the name of women, minorities, diversity, helping minority races. These days will come. And on those days, if you are the difference between being willing to take the hit to help people out or not, that's the difference with helping. I've seen both. I've seen people really be willing to be like, yes, it's worth it for us to turn down this client to support the minorities in our company because we know this client's offensive or whatever, like those sorts of situations. And I've seen us be like, well, yeah, this employee has been saying racist stuff, but we can't fire them. They bring in sales, right? Like that, those differences, that's where you're going to help out more than anything, I would say. Thank you so much for sharing that. I know that our audience is going to gain so much from that advice and, and that words of encouragement there. So last formal question before I jump into a quick lightning round, and that is, what's the one thing you want people to learn from your story? That's a good question. I think I want people to learn that they can be ambitious, they can get more done than they think, but also that doesn't have to come at the cost of like having no other life outside of, you know, data science and spending all your free time, like your training models. So for example, right, we wrote this book that obviously was pretty time consuming, but Jacqueline was you know, raising a, an infant and then toddler while doing it, you know, I still like went out to dinner, you know, went, went out on weekends. But, you know, now I get to look back and I was like, wow, my first couple of years of a data scientist, like I've published a book. And, you know, so sometimes you just got to like set some ambitious goals, but find people who can help you along the way and you don't need to do it alone. So I'm so thankful that I had Jacqueline as a co-author for doing this. And also I know some other folks who wrote books, um, data science books. We asked them for some advice. It, yeah, I would say like just you can do maybe more than you think, but you don't have to do it alone and you don't, and it doesn't have to take up all of your time and block out everything else. So for mine, we didn't really talk about this, but the chapter that I wrote that I'm the most proud of is a chapter in our book about failure. And what do you do when your data science projects fail? And so I've been a data scientist for many years and many, many, many of my projects have failed. And it's been a lot of career growth to go from, wow, this project failed and I'm a failure and I don't know how to do data science to, hey, failing is a very natural part of this. The fact that I'm failing means that I'm trying, which is important. And, you know, successes periodically come and this is just an acceptable risk. And there's a whole chapter about how to handle that and what do you do when there's failures. And I think the thing I want people to get on my story is just, hey, let's be open about failures. Let's talk about failures and let's just create a data science as a more emotionally vulnerable space where we can talk about our weakness, you know, areas where we're weak, feeling weak or anxious, like we can just feel safe in talking about them. And if you don't want to buy the book, Definitely buy the book. It's so good. No, if you don't want to buy the book, I do have a talk version of that chapter online. It's about an hour. I talk about my five biggest failures in my career and then what I learned from them. And I think that like that's the sort of thing I want people to get on my story of like, hey, we're all people. This is a field about humans, not a field just about numbers. And let's care about our emotions. I absolutely love it. And that chapter is helping me go through my own failure right now. Yeah, it's helping me. <laughs> yeah, that chapter was really, I, I wrote it for me 10 years ago. I'm like, here, past me, this is the chapter you need. And so, yes, it's really nice to hear that that is also helping other people. And I'll definitely go ahead and look for that talk as well. And I encourage everyone to check this book out. It's probably the most different and most amazing book on data science because it's not even about data science per se. It's just about persons, it's about the data scientist, which I think is awesome. So thank you both for writing this book. So let's go ahead and jump into a quick lightning round. And again, we'll keep the alphabetical order going here. The first question is, what do you believe that other people think is crazy? I think that probably about 80% of the work that data scientists do is not useful to anyone. Not like, oh, data cleaning isn't useful, but like, no, like 80% of the models data science builds are like just not useful, right? Like churn models, forecasts, blah, blah, blah. As a field, we make so many things that no one ever uses. The 20% that end up being useful are so useful that it makes the rest worthwhile. But I think 80% of what we do is just, we should have never even started on this and we're just unwilling to quit right now. 
And I think that, yeah. So I think as a field, we haven't really grappled yet with how do we quit early? And I think maybe that's my like hottest data science take that people might think is just buck wild. Um, yeah, that's what I got. Yeah, I feel like you're so much more original than me, Jacqueline. I'm like, I'm like thinking of stuff, but I was like, well, I saw this person on Twitter once who also said that they think this is true. So I think you have a, you have a good hot take there. I've thought about that. No, sorry, I've thought about that when people like unpopular, quote your unpopular opinions, like 90% of the time when someone mm-hmm. quotes, says an unpopular opinion, it is actually an extremely popular opinion, but just in the subset of people they aren't <laughs> a, a part of. So it's like, no, really say your offensive takes. Like, I think dogs should vote. They're like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I do think my dog Abby should vote. I guess I think, well, this is still TBD. Well, actually, probably a lot of people agree with me on this, but maybe it's more of a hope than like a wild take, but that data science needs to shift out of just like being in San Francisco, you know, even in New York, it's sort of like the second biggest thing. And, you know, we really, I don't believe in this like data is a new oil, but I think uh, set up correctly, a lot of companies could benefit or actually maybe specifically data analytics. I think maybe that's the hottest take. I feel like a lot of folks focus on like machine learning or like, you know, oh my gosh, we got to get machine learning. We'll have like this awesome algorithm. It's like, no, 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 just get someone who can like actually pull the numbers from your Excel spreadsheet of doom, which probably is a ton of errors because it's 50 spreadsheets long and like all color coded and just like get someone who can wrangle the data effectively. And that's going to deliver so much more to your business than hiring some like PhD machine learning engineer. So I actually think this is fascinating because I think at some level, we are saying opposite things when we say our things. Because like, <laughs> at some level, mine is we need less data science and yours is we need more data science. And I think it's pretty easy to put that into we need less useless fancy data science and more sure. simple basic data science. But like at some level, we are saying opposite things. And I, I love that. Yeah. I mean, a lot of basic data scientists, that data science also never gets used. Just like ask any data scientist about a dashboard that, that they built. And they'd be like, yeah, it was used for like three days. And then like, that took no three months to build. It. Yeah. Yep. yep. I'm still licking some wounds about a um, dashboard and not knowing when to quit on projects. So yeah, a lot of stuff is just super hyped up. I think we should just keep it simple, parsimonious and deliver results. That was very entertaining. Thank you guys for that one. So if you could put up a billboard anywhere, what would you put on it? I think I would put just something nonsensical to make people feel like better, like keep at it. And like like a person giving a thumbs up, like, like or like a nice mountain picture scene. Like I just, like, let's get a little extra cheer. Things are grim. Yeah, I like that. I also, it's hard to think of like a best for everyone, but like, I guess something along the lines of like, there's room for everyone and like other people's success does not diminish yours. Like how we talked about all this gatekeeping and data science. And I think it's like people really feel threatened. That's like, well, if they're going to call the data scientists, but I work so much harder than them. I did this fancy thing. And like, that's not fair. And it's like, there is room for, for everyone. And you know, that, that everything is not a zero sum game. What's an academic topic or area of research or interest that is outside of data science and mathematics and statistics that you think every data scientist should spend some time researching up on? I have an extremely hot take on this. God, I love them hot. So this is not academic, but so much of data science is storytelling, right? Like I was saying, like getting in front of executives and convincing something with data. And so often people come to me, and I assume Emily too, with like, well, how do I get good at the storytelling? I want to do storytelling. What about storytelling? What book should I read? And do you know who's really good at storytelling? Stand-up comedians. Like stand-up comedians are amazing at like, here's a premise, and then this happens, and this is funny results. Ha, ha, ha. And like, there's a timing element to it. They're always about captivating your attention. Like there are beats to it. That sort of presentation of information that a stand-up does is very much similar to what I do when I'm giving a conference talk or in front of an executive. Like it is less funny generally, but that style of like, hey, I'm going to be engaging with you, captivate your attention and get you to think about something is something data scientists really have to do. And I think like strangely, if you are a junior data scientist and you want to get better at storytelling, I really recommend just like watching stand-up comedians and really trying to dissect what they do in any given minute of it. Any particular stand-up comedian that we can learn from? I just watched it. Oh my God. It's not Nanette. What was the second one? Emily, did you watch it? God. Oh, oh. Douglas. Uh, yes, Douglas. Hannah Gadsby? Yes, Douglas. That stand-up on Netflix is very funny. She tells a bunch of stories in there that are really, she has stories in there. Just watch. But yes, really go on Netflix, find stand-up you like. I think that's a great, great thing to do. I also like John Mulaney a lot. One oh my of my God, friends so once funny. put it, like yeah. he's the only white man I trust. 
<laughs> so Emily, same question for you. Oh, Emily. yes. So I'm a bit biased because, uh, but I would say actually like the, you know, my background in organizational behavior is I really think pretty much like anyone like working in industry should read because organizational behavior covers things like you know, negotiation, it covers the idea of passion. There's a really, this was, it's not exactly organizational behavior, but a book I really like is called Unlocking the Clubhouse, which was uh, two Carnegie Mellon professors, one, I think a computer science, one, maybe sociology studying why there weren't many women in the computer science undergraduate program. Um, and so they did a qualitative study. They did lots of interviews and it was really interesting. And one of the things I took away from it was a big thing they found was women would say, well, you know, I haven't been wanting to do this since I was five and I don't dream in code like they do. So this idea of what you need to be passionate to be successful in computer science and passion is a very specific thing. That's just like this myopic focus on computer that you've had since you were a kid. So I really think there's just a lot people can learn. And besides that book, Harvard Business Review is a great place to start because people will publish that for a more popular audience. And it's a lot less uh, and they might give an overview of a bunch of studies on negotiations rather than you having to read like 20 different academic papers. And so my next question is going to be the number one book, fiction or nonfiction that you'd recommend our audience take, or rather you recommend our audience read and your most impactful takeaway from it. Does that book recommendation stand or is there another one that you want to I really want to recommend that, but I also would love to recommend, this is one of the books you recommend in our book in the resources section, which is Bird by Bird, Some Instructions on Writing and Life by Anne Lamott. So it's kind of a mix of like, obviously it's instruction on writing. It's also a bit of memoir. It's just an, a really excellent book. And I think a big takeaway from that, the title comes from when she was growing up and I think it was her brother had this project on birds do. And it was this like really big project that he was supposed to do over the course of like months. And he just hadn't done any of it. And it's the night before and he's freaking out because he's supposed to be, you know, it's supposed to, I don't know, like write up about like 30 birds or something. It's this huge thing. And uh, their father just said to him, you know, just take it bird by bird. So basically take it piece by piece. And I think that it might be really helpful for folks looking to get into data science, because if you look at the whole field, if you look at all the things that like are on some list of like things you have to know, it's just completely overwhelming. But remembering like you can take it piece by piece, you can build incrementally. And also like SQL with data science, you don't actually need to know that top 20 list. Like I don't know half the things on it. And I am still a data scientist. I love it. Jacqueline. Okay. So I got two, one, nonfiction helpful. So nonfiction helpful, uh, there's a book, Typical Conversations, How to Discuss What Matters Most. Like I was like, I think I said like eight times in this podcast, but I really believe it. So much of data science is the work of convincing someone else of an idea using data. And this book just discusses like just really how to think about conversations and, you know, how to express ideas that may be controversial to others, especially, right? Like if you have a model that shows something and, but, you know, the executive believes the opposite these can be very difficult conversations. Um, so I found that book to be illustrative. And the other book I would recommend, totally unrelated, non or fiction, is I just really like The Fifth Season, which is by N.K. Jemsen. Yes. Um, and it's so good. And it's a series. That's the first book of three. They're fascinating. I burned through them so fast. She's a Black woman author. So you can support, you know, uh, Black authors. And it's just, it's a great book. Highly recommend. Lots of fun. Yeah. And that trilogy, I believe, so it, it came out, I think one year after each one came out a year later. I think she's the only author to ever win the Hugo Award three years in a row, which is this like biggest award for, um, you know, sci-fi and fantasy writing. And she won it for each of those books. So it's just an excellent Very series. Good. Yeah. I'll definitely be adding those to the show notes and I'll check them out myself as well. Thank you so much for that. So if we could somehow get a magic telephone that allowed you to contact your 18 year old self, what would you say? You know, I maybe say don't stress so much, but like in general, and like, you know, things will, things will work out, but like in general, look, I'm pretty happy where I am now. And so I don't think even, you know, there was some experience like, oh, I wish I had like known that earlier. Like maybe I should have taken another computer science class would have been helpful. I think overall, I like Steve Jobs quote, like you could only connect the dots looking backward and looking backward, I can really see how everything led up to where I am now. But if I had set out with this plan, like I want to be here where I am, like, you know, 10 years later, I don't think it would have happened. So I think actually just sort of going with, you know, okay, this is what I kind of want to do. 
you know, right now or this is our experience and not worrying about like a five or 10 year plan because just so much changes any case, especially in a field like data science. Yeah. So I think mine is similar. And I've also had the thought of like, well, if I went back in time, I wouldn't, I would change the things that the bad things that have happened to me or the things that have been difficult are by far the areas where I've learned the most. So I don't want to avoid the difficult things that I've ended up doing in my life because those have in many ways been the most helpful. But I think maybe that would be my advice to my 18 year old self. So 18 year old Jacqueline was so obsessed with optimally living my life and getting into the best college and getting the right major and blah, blah, blah. And like doing this real optimization, I think it's kind of ingrained into us of like, you have to do everything right if you want to be the most successful in life. And I think the message I'm trying to see, receive is, hey, you learn the most from the failures. Don't stress so much of and try and optimize so much to do the exact optimal thing because there is no optimal thing. There's no one parameter you can optimize. There's every decision is going to have different outcomes in different ways and stressing about A or B or anything like that, it, do- it doesn't really help you in the end at all. What's the best advice that you've ever received? You want to go first, Jacqueline? Yeah, sure. So years ago, I had a boss. So this is maybe not directly advice, but years ago, I had a boss and I was a more junior. You know, I was just starting to like kind of do leadership things. Like I think it was the first time I helped start a team, but I was still pretty junior at being a leader. And my boss, I thought was a really great leader, just really fantastic. And so he didn't give me advice, but he was such a good role model that I like basically just tried to mimic exactly what he did. And what what was that? It was very much, you know, he was very open with his employees and things are going well, where they weren't. You know, he was just very clear and very calm with here's what's going on, here's why, and here's how I feel about it. But similarly, like when he was in a meeting with clients or anything like that, he just was very cautious and slow and methodical in the way he talked and thought and really took his time. If someone said something to him, he would wait, he'd think about it for a second and then give a response. And so this is an advice, but by watching him act, I realized that so much of my behavior was anxiety induced. I'm moving so fast. I want to do everything as fast as I can because you got to do things fast. You got to think fast. And allowing yourself to slow down, take time, really just, you know, not rush and just give things the care they're due that makes an enormous difference in how you work as a leader. And uh, that just totally changed my perception of uh, how I should think about working. And for me, it's similar. It's not exactly like advice I was given, but watching other people and sort of being thrust into myself, which is something called like uh, talk-driven development. So <laughs> there are some uh, data scientists that I know that will sign up to like give a keynote on you know this new package that they have not actually written yet, but there is now a deadline and they have to, you know, get working on that package because they've committed to speaking about it. So in in my case, uh, the first talk I ever gave was about six months into working at Etsy. It was at a local meetup because the organizer, Jared Lander, Lander asked not if, but when I would be speaking. And I don't think without that push, I necessarily would have done it, but by like, all right, I guess I'll like, oh, I've had like a couple months, I'll sign up in August, I'll talk about A-B testing, which is what I've been doing at Etsy. Uh, That was really helpful to me. So I think what that kind of comes down to is knowing yourself, knowing what motivates you, and sometimes having, being pushed a little bit to share externally can really help, at least for me, like motivate myself and also give back. And so that's something I really care about. What song do you currently have on repeat? So I have a toddler, which means that every time we get into the car, he wants to listen to the same song over and over. And that song just happens to be Me by Taylor Swift and that guy from Panic at the Disco. But yes, Taylor Swift's Me is um, absolutely what's on repeat in my life right now. And for me, so actually, it's funny. So Spotify makes you like an on-repeat playlist. And I'll often just like put on that playlist because I'm definitely someone who can listen to the same song over and over and over again for hours. So some of the ones are on. We just watched Hamilton. Uh, so I saw the show about four years ago. But we just watched the, the movie, which I highly recommend. So that's one of them. And then also some songs from uh, Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, which is a TV show that I really recommend. Yeah, definitely meaning to check out Hamilton. I noticed that it's on Disney On Demand now. So that is lined up for this weekend. Looking forward to that. Thank you for those song. Uh, I'll just call them recommendations. So where can people find the book? This depends on your personality. So if you're more like, you know, serious, like career oriented, you can find it at datasicareer.com or Jacqueline. <laughs> Or, and you can tell which one of us has which URL. <laughs> or if you go to bestbook.cool, you will get the more zesty, hey, we're going to nail it, do great with our careers version of the book. Now, both of those URLs will bring you to the exact same site, but which aura is you're going to bring with you as you purchase the book uh, depends on if you use datasidecareer.com or bestbook.cool. 
Yeah. And both of those lead to Manning. It also is available on Amazon, but we recommend Manning because you can also get 40% off at any time with the code build book 40%. So, and 40% is four zero percent sign. Yeah. And you, um, if you buy the print version on Manning, you get the print and the ebook for free in there. It's so it's like, it's cheaper than Amazon. You get more. It's like, yeah, you also get, if you get the book on Amazon, the physical copy, there is a, like, they do this weird thing where you also get the ebook copy by like, you know, they have the special code hidden in the book. Well, I know. learned something from listening to this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so how can people connect with you? Where can they find you online? We're both highly Twitter people, very Twitter. Yes. Yeah, so Twitter is a good place. So I'm Robinson underscore E-S. And I am Sky Tetra. That's S K Y E. T-E-T-R-A, Sky Tetra. And we also both have blogs and websites. So mine is hookedondata.org. And I am jnolis.com. And that's where you can get like, yeah, we I think we all have our talks and videos and, blah, 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 mm-hmm. and blog posts. Yeah. Jacqueline, Emily, thank you so much for taking thank time you. out of your schedule to be here today. I really, really appreciate just everything. Uh, it was a fun conversation. My first time doing two people and you just happen to be the two most coolest people ever. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much.